the beauty of jazz is that there are so many great people who on any given solo can manifest something you never thought of. It's not reduced just to the people who are famous or the people you know. It's like life. In any day or in any moment, a person can lift you up and show you another way to view the world. Winton Marsalis, welcome to 7.30. Thank you so much. Maybe more than any other form of music, improvisation in jazz requires mus musicians to keenly listen to what others around them are doing. But it strikes me that one thing that makes you quite unique is the way you recognised really early on the extraordinary position you were in when you were young to listen to what the greats had to tell you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I was fortunate to grow up with a father that's uh, a jazz musician in a time that musicians would travel around the country as singles. And I was always with my father. And I was, uh, even though I didn't necessarily like the music they were playing, I always liked to hear the stories they were telling. So Clark Terry played with Count Basie and with Duke Ellington's orchestra. Sweet Edison played with the great Count Basie orchestra that uh, left Kansas City in the 30s. And Sonny Stead and so on and so forth. The list goes on and on. I was always around them. And uh, they're very colorful. Why didn't you like the music? The music is complicated, and there's a lot going on, and it wasn't something you heard on the radio. I, I liked the music everybody of my generation liked, and time, to, what we played, the dances, and what we sang, and the song, the music had words. Their music was no words. So it was, it was challenging to listen to. As you got older though, you did go and seek those people out, people like Sweets Edison, Sarah Vaughan, yes. uh, Aretha Franklin. Why did you go and find them? Well, first, they, the, just the, the knowledge they, they had, and they were very colorful and funny. And I had the opportunity to play with them. And sometimes it just, uh, for, for, for older musicians to talk to a younger musician who's interested in what they're saying um, is, uh, they, they, they love doing that. And that many great lessons, like Sarah Vaughan really could play piano, like a virtuosic level. I remember I was 21, I played with her at uh, Boston Pops, and it was, it was a, on a television show, and I was showing off for her. I was playing a Duke Ellington song, Tonight I Shall Sleep With a Smile on My Face, and it's a complicated song in the key of E, and I knew nobody else 21 would know this song. So I, I didn't really know the bridge or section that well, and I played it and she listened to it. She said, yeah, baby, you played that good, but you, you need to learn these songs thoroughly and off the recording. And then she went to the piano and played, and she played so much piano. At that time, I didn't know her pedigree. And I remember after she played, she said, you see what I'm saying? I thought, damn, she plays all that piano and she's singing. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's always uh, interesting. Aretha Franklin, I would, I would talk with Aretha late at night, sometimes one or two hours. And one night she said, you know, I know you're wondering, why is Aretha talking to me about all these people? She said, you're the only young person I know who knows who any of these people are. <laughs> so we would, we would laugh, but she was so, uh, so funny and full of life and information and intelligence. And when she would tell you one or two things, those things could take you in another whole direction and a, a historical understanding and an understanding of what, what her father was like as a preacher, what was going on at the time, jazz musicians she loved, you know, it's always a lot of information. It seems they were very good at both gently putting you in your place um, and teaching you important lessons. Right, well, that's, that's the fun of it. Yeah. You and, know? <laughs> um, well, some of those lessons, um, were, were they important in what you refer to as finding your own voice? Yeah, I think that something Sweet Edison told me about, about finding your own voice, he, he talked in a kind of twang, like, well, baby boy, you got to understand that you, you, you're running around here trying to find find yourself you're already yourself you're not ever gonna find that it's like trying to find some keys that's in your hand you're gonna look forever so you know they were kind of they would they could be be cutting and biting but they also had a lot of love like it was always it's very familial i i wondered uh, when i was uh, preparing this it struck me that most of those jazz greats have of course left us yeah. does it sometimes make it feel a bit lonelier than it once was? 
you know, for, for, for them, it's like a person in your family that you, but they knew, I think when I met them, they knew it was gonna be that time as I know with the younger musicians that I know and play with. And it's not lonely because there are a lot of younger ones have come up. Of course, I have all of my great colleagues and people my age and all the ages younger than, than I am. In our music, we all play together across the generations. So that makes the music very, very different. We're not separated in that way. Did the fact that you were playing across genres from classical to jazz make finding your voice harder? No, I don't, I don't think, um, I think to find your voice or your way in life as a journey we all have to go through in our own way. And you have to, Carlos Enrique as our bassist said it once in a class we were teaching together. I he's Carlos maybe 15 years younger than me and I taught him when he was a kid, when he was 13 or 14. And we were talking to some kids and he said, it's like breaking up with a, with a girlfriend or somebody you really loved. That you love these styles and you love this person and you love this, but at a certain point, you have to break up with them. And you have to say, I'm not complete yet. Thank you for what you taught me. Thank you for the things that we went through. I love you, but I have to go in this direction to develop. And it's a journey that we all go through and continue to go through through our lives, even at the age I am now. In order for me to grow and develop, I have to, I have to disassociate myself with myself. And I have to be willing to sit in discomfort with the views of other people that I may not agree with, or learn other musicians' music, or listen to music that I don't know, or try to play things that I cannot play. And uh, that's just uh, what happens. Well, jazz has been called America's music, uh, and its roots are obviously st steeped in American history and culture. Where do you see jazz in 2023? You know, jazz is always, uh, it's always been, it's, it's been embraced by some elements of the culture, but it's always been functioned like an orphan. It, it, I always laugh, it's like television shows I would go on in the 1980, 84, 85, the Phil Donahue show or some kind of show that, that everyone in America would look at. The, the question first was, what are you here to do? Okay, you play a trumpet, well, do you sing? Can you play a slow one? I mean, can you play a fast one? Like, it was always like trying to figure out how can I get you in a position where you don't actually play jazz so that we can like it. It goes back to how I felt about the music when I was listening to it as a kid. And I had a joke that I was always telling them, well, we don't have to play. We can always just stand up with our horns and you can talk to us. And uh, the music, it, it requires education. And for, the, for there to be a national attempt to educate the nation about the greatness of Louis Armstrong or Duke Ellington, it goes so much against the role that those, the role that black Americans many times are required to play. There's no problem if they act in a fool or, or, or using a certain type of language or giving you pathology. Oh, there's plenty of bandwidth, there's plenty of TV time, there's plenty of money for it. But if you bring a perspective on the country and if you are considered in that perspective and much of what you say refutes the accepted mythology, well, I like you, brother, but we just don't want, it's not, it's not the general thoughts, and we don't want those thoughts to be challenged. And uh, that's true of anything that's, that's countercultural. There is a mythology in a way every group wants to perceive itself. If you fit into that mythology comfortably, you're okay. If you really help the mythology, you're great. If you counterstate that mythology, especially at the top of it, man, you know, it's like you go to a kid's house and they want you to always be the bad person. No, no, I'm the good guy. You're the bad guy, right? Well, I want to be the good. No, 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 you're the bad guy. I'm the good guy. No, 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 you're the bad. It's like you're always put in a, in a place of having to be a fool. And our music is not like that. Like you just can't make it be that. You've been called a romantic because you favor greats like Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington. But what you're saying sort of suggests in some ways there's still a job to be done in getting people to see it for what it is in its true glory. More, more the intelligentsia and the, the people, if you play for the people, they like the music. If you can get in front of them. And we've been out here now for 40 years and I, I mean, we play everywhere. The people come out even when they don't really 
they haven't been educated in music, they, okay, there's a lot of people can play in the band, they go with it. And the kind of intelligentsia and the gatekeepers of the culture, and that's a much more difficult group. That's a group that's, that is uh, dedicated to making sure that the people don't have access to the true feeling of, of things. So there's always a commentary. It's, it's kind of funny experience I had with Chat GPT where my students were sending me prompts that they would give something I said to J Chat GPT. And I said, the Chat GPT is actually saying what I would say. I said, they haven't had a chance to manipulate it yet to make it be full of all this cultural mumbo jumbo that makes you not want to read it. And uh, it, it, it's a, an ongoing struggle. It's not just relegated to America and the Afro-American. It's a struggle that has gone throughout human history of how to get access to more and more information that's not sanctioned. What, what are you listening to now and respecting? You know, just this morning I put on Kenny Durham a, a recording called Short Story. It was him playing in Copenhagen in 1963. And I was just listening to him. I was, I was thinking about how I wanted to listen to more music. So I was listening to him uh, play fantastic Neil, Neil Henning's Orsted Pedersen on the bass and Tete Montelieu is a European rhythm section, really swinging. Um, and, and I just listened to that, to that whole record. And in between that, I was listening to a German soldier's accounting of why they lost World War, why he felt they lost, they lost the momentum uh, of, the, of, the, of D Day. It was very interesting. And I go between that and uh, m many other styles of music and, and things that are, are, are related about. Uh, I, I, I'm so happy that it just it was a time when you had to go to libraries, you had to research everything. Now you can get everything. So I like to just go from thing to thing and compare different types of information and the music is one, one type of it. Is there one particular album that stands out, Blue Note or anything from the period, that period of the jazz greats that you gravitate to repeatedly? St still listening with fresh ears? You know, not now, not, not, not so much. Like once I could, what I, what I had to do as I grew older was listen to music of all the decades. Like it was a time when I would never listen to something from 1920s. Or, so that's kind of the first really good recorded decade. And I, and I don't mean listen to like recordings of classical music from the 1500s or the 1600s, 1700s. Okay, that was always, that's a part of school. So if you, if you learn history of Western music, that's the music you're learning. It was hard for me to listen to Basie's orchestra in the 30s or Duke's music in the 30s. It's record is scratchy and what are the objectives of the music. And then in the 40s, I had holes in my, my knowledge. Well, I was from kind of the 70s, I was a kid. So I, all the fusion in the music we played in that time is my era. The 80s is my contemporaries. 90s were a little younger than me. So as I, as I grew older, I would always try to just listen to different types of music and I go into like a dive on the different musics that I may not like and try to, to, to understand. Um, and then I listen to other cultures and musics too. I don't, I don't really go repeatedly back to a single document. You know, I go back to single concepts maybe. Like maybe one concept would be a drone, like something going yaw. I was talking this morning to Chris, a fantastic musician, we're talking about didgeridoo. And the piece All Rise that I wrote, I wanted the choir to sound like a didgeridoo. And it's supposed to go yong, 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 yong. But I couldn't get the singers to do that, so they ended up saying gang, gang, but it wasn't gang, it was yong, yong, yong. And then we started to talk about Mongolian singing with the with the harmonics and we start talking about the bagpipes and the drone and Indian music and the drone that they use and Middle Eastern music and the drone. And I said, well, Mahler, in a Mahler symphony, you were talking about, we were talking earlier before the interview of Mahler's Eighth Symphony, Mahler will sit on a, a pedal point for four minutes, five minutes easily, and just waft the melodies on top of it. So I tend to go to concepts, that of the African 6-8 and the way it's interpreted in different claves. Ding, 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 I listen to all music, uh, like a 6-8 rhythm, like a, a, a a jig, a six eight march, Italian music, African six eight, ding 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 ding. I try I try to just 
listen to different styles and figure out how those fundamentals played out across the world. You know, and, and it's, it's I, I go more toward that than I go towards a record I heard when I was younger, even though I still like those, those, those recordings. Well, you've written a vast body of work uh, in your own right, and you'll be playing some of the symphonic works while you're here in Australia. What is it about that intersection that feels so great to play? And what is jazz about an orchestra? And <laughs> what is symphonic about a big band? That's a great question. <laughs> I got to give you credit for that one. <laughs> well, you touched on the whole of, uh, of, of like so much stuff is gray area, right? It's like male and female. Okay, but there's a lot of gray area. And, uh, and there's a lot of not gray area. <laughs> What's jazz about symphonic music is the underlying forms, the use of harmony, diversity of orchestration, the development of thematic material, the separation of things into families that interplay, like the percussion family is going to play a certain way. They have a high, medium, and low. The saxophone section has that. The trumpet section has it. The trombones and the brass section. The use of brass for punctuation and power, jazz bands use that. The use of saxophones, like a string section, we have that. The similarity of, of, of the relationship of melodies to counter melodies, of a kind of shining or magic of discovery when things, when ideas come up, well, I didn't know that. The juxtaposition of ideas that you find when you're improvising, that's, that's the thing that's jazz about symphonic music. And what's symphonic about jazz is the orchestration of the instruments. The fundamental march concept of trombones play long notes, trumpets play medium notes, clarinets play fast notes. Uh, that's the basis of Duke Ellington's style and certainly of jazz composition. The use of saxophones in a, in a homogenous body, like a string section. The uh, call and response in Asia, Beethoven's third is call and response, Haydn's music, call and response. Also in New Orleans music, it's like Baroque music, not so much call and response, but boom, 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 the thing that's always bouncing on every beat. There's been so many um, similarities between Bach's Brandenburg concertos and King Oliver's early music because everybody's playing polyphonically, eighth, 16th notes and 8th notes at the same time, in the same time field. And of course, I could go on and on and on. There are many similarities. There's a joint history, a Western history. And even in symphonic music, there's an African history that's not as acknowledged. But even in Schoenberg's music, there's an attempt to deal with a kind of Africanization of rhythm because he was looking at what Picasso and the other early 20th century artists were doing with African art and thinking, man, how can I in music use what these people are doing in their rhythms and the things that they're using to enhance my music? The African music is much more difficult for Western musicians to understand because they play in two polarities at once. So we we're not going to play in 3-4 four and 4-4 four, four at the same time. And, and it's not just a polyrhythm when they do it. They have two polarized concepts, like the, 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 that male and female rhythm is always going on at the same time, and they dance on either side of it. It's very difficult for us to, to hear. And, you know, you get me going on that stuff. It's very tech. Some of it is technical, so it's not something people are interested in, in hearing. But suffice it to say that music from all over the world is connected. And, and it, it, it is. It's just a matter of figuring out where those intersection points that you can understand. You're a committed musical educator. What, what's the thing that you can pass on? I mean, you know, we can all teach notes, but what's the thing that you can really teach people or get, bring out of themselves? Um, a, a love for themselves and their ability and a love for the thing that you are teaching them and the feeling that goes between y'all. Like that's, that's the thing you, you want to communicate. You said that jazz can improve your life. Has it improved yours? I mean, it's, it's defined mine, so I can't even, I mean, if you could actually hear the music and understand what the great musicians like, uh, you take your pick. And, you know, it could, it could be of the ones I've known. They, they were all dipped in rainbow dust. Like if you could have known John Lewis or Sweet Edison or Jerry Mulligan, 
or, or Dave Brubeck, if you could have known them and what their aspirations were for the world. And it's also reflected in the younger musicians we have now. And I could talk about them. No, nobody knows their names. But there's Sean Mason and Joe Block. And if you know them as, as even as younger people and the spirit they have and the feeling that comes out of them. And, and Chris Lewis and Nicole Glover. And, you know, they just, it's something in the music. It, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that's, that's palpable. But it's also very etheric. It's very ephemeral. It's a fantastic quality. Finally, world's most unfair question. <laughs> Who are the three greatest jazz musicians of all time? <laughs> you know, there's, there's no... The music is so much about a lot of people doing things. It's about people doing things the, together. That's the, the actual... It is reduced, it's put into the Western construct of a great person. But that's not the meaning of the music. And I think the blessing I've had in my life is to start playing with four people and then play with five and then six and then 15 and sometimes 200. And uh, coming from a big family, I remember once we had a period where we didn't have f the food we were eating, it was like beans and you know, it was always stuff that people who don't have a lot eat that. So once. We're eating something, and I was complaining to my older brother Branford about, you know, I, I want more. And he took something off of his plate and put it on mine, and he said, now we have more. <laughs> we were kids, and we both laughed about it. But, you know, in jazz, jazz allowed for many more great people, because if you could learn how to play an instrument, you could be documented, and your, your brilliance could. I was thinking this morning when I was listening to that Kenny Durham record, Tete Montelieu's piano playing. And I, I didn't know who it was. I had played with Tete and I knew him, you know, he's from Spain. And I thought, damn, who was playing all this piano? And then when I realized it was Tete, I thought the beauty of jazz is that there are so many great people who on any given solo can manifest something you never thought of. It's not reduced just to the people who are famous or the people you know. It's like life. In any day or in any moment, a person can lift you up and show you another way to view the world. Like, I didn't have any idea of the high quality questions you were going to ask me. And I'm not saying it even as a joke or in a, as a, in, I'm not being patronizing in any way. I had no idea when I sat down there. Maybe three or four of those questions, I've been being asked questions since I was 18. I'm 61. Three or four of your questions are the best questions I've ever been asked. And I interviewed people for, for CBS 60 Minutes and for other articles, I was struggling, what can I ask people? And I asked so many dumb questions to people. <laughs> I'm listening to your questions, I'm thinking, damn, these are some good questions. You know, so that's the thing in the music, it's not any three people, it's many people. Well, thank you so much for lifting us all up tonight. Hey, thank you so much. Thank Pleasure. you. Wow. Thank you. Yes, ma'am.